All right. Welcome to Rich Conversations. Today we have another great episode. We have Jose Contreras joining us all the way from Bogota, Colombia. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rich. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself for uh, listeners and viewers? Well, as you said, I'm Jose Contreras. Um, I'm a software engineer. I was born in Venezuela, but currently I'm living in Colombia. Um, I have also Colombian nationality because of my mom. She's from here, from Pereira. So it's like a, a, a return back because my mom went to Venezuela in the 70s. So I'm coming back from, from six years ago. Um, yeah, I'm a software engineer working as a project manager in a software company. Very nice. Um, so what's the general vibe in Bogota? Well, Bogota is a big, big city. Uh, I think it's one of the biggest cities in, in Latin America. Um, it's, a, it's a cool city. I mean, it, it differs from the rest of the country because it's like a, a cold city. It's very, it's very high. It's like uh, 2,600 meters above the sea level. So it's very high. It's very uh, cold usually. Even though with the global warming, I think it has changed a little bit its its, its weather. Uh, usually in January, in February, it's really hot. But for example, due to the height, uh, I don't know, 20 degrees Celsius is like really hot, really hot for us. While in other cities, is cold or a fresh uh, a fresh day. Really. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's really, really odd. For example, in Medellin, the usual temper temperature is like 28, 26. And the hottest day here in Bogota ever registered was 26 degrees Celsius. So, and we were born in, <laughs> actually, it was really, really hot. Wow. So the elevation that Bogota has is different than the other major cities in Colombia. So it makes it kind of unique. Yes, exactly. Uh, the, the fashion is different because you have to go with a sweater or a jacket and other cities are like more, uh, like uh, they say that for example, Medellin is like the city of the eternal spring because it's always, the, all the year it has the same, the, same, the same weather. So here is cold and really cold. <laughs> And some days are hot, but usually in the south uh, winter, because usually in the winter, uh, in the south of the world, the winter is in December, January, and February. So those are the more hot days here in Bogota. But also you have to take your umbrella and your sweater because you never know if there's a cloud, then the, the weather is going to change. It's going to be cold. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. So how would, how else uh, besides climate would you describe the differences between um, Bogota and the other big Colombian cities? Well, also as is the capital of Colombia, there's a lot of people from from inside the country. So there's a, a, a big mix of of Colombia, and Colombia has different regions, and each region is like an an own country because they have different cultures, different costumes. A different food, so you can find them all here, and 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 it's really nice to see that difference and becoming like one thing in the same city. So yeah. I think it's a like a, a city that integrates all Colombian culture. Wow! So so is it the major major city? Yes. I mean, it's obviously uh, the capital. Yes, yes. Okay, the, city, the country. So I'm thinking the other ones are uh, Medellin and Cali. Medellin, the other big ones? Barranquilla, and Cali. Okay. Wow. So what... So what example, Barranquilla and Medellin are cities. Barranquilla is in the coast, in the Caribbean coast. Okay. Cali is close to the Pacific coast. And Medellin is in the center of the country also. Yeah, I'm looking at a, a map right now. Yeah. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, that's interesting. And in economic importance, I believe Medellin is the second one. And okay. Barranquilla is the third one, probably. Which one? Which? 
in Medellin, the second one, and Barranquilla, the third one. Oh, the yeah. One. It's weird because, like, you have, like, Cali by the Pacific, and then, uh, how do you say it? Barranquilla? Barranquilla. <laughs> Barranquilla on the, like, Atlantic Ocean. Yes. It's, the, like, it's like on a different side of Panama. Um, exactly. Wow. So Colombia so, has a, a, a lot of extension in, in, in coast on the Pacific side and on the Caribbean side. I didn't look this up beforehand, but where does Colombia kind of rank among like South America exports and like GDP? Like I imagine Brazil and Argentina do a lot of exports, uh, right? Yeah, I don't know if Argentina is still in, in that position because, you know, because of the whole political and social economic changes. Mm. Uh, but I think it's located like fourth or fifth, something like that. It's in the first countries in Latin yeah. America. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So then how would you describe, okay, what are the people like in Bogota and Colombia overall? People from Bogota differ a little bit from the rest of the country. Uh, I will say that it's because of the weather, uh, but in general, people is very kind. Uh, for example, I got a friend coming from Spain. He's a Venezuelan. He was living in he's living in Spain, so he was here like for three days, and he was amazed about how kind the people were and how good attention they give to the to the customers. So he, he said that he liked that uh, a lot, and you can find that in all Colombia. But usually I think, for example, me being from Venezuela and being an outsider, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's been hard to make friends because they have like their inner circles and they come from college or from high school. Um, so people are like a, a, little, a little bit closed in, in that matter, but they are nice and you talk to someone in, in the supermarket or I don't know, in the street, they are going to talk to you and they're going to be, to be very nice. But you know, for example, in the coast of Colombia, people are really open and they're, they're really welcoming and come here and they're integrate you to, to your group, also in Medellin okay. or Cali, the so-called paisas. Um, they are like super welcoming and super attentive with people. So that I think that will be the, the main difference. How would you describe the like cultural differences between Venezuela and Colombia? Yes, yes and no. I think that once we were the same country, we were called the like, Grand Colombia. It was Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia. So we were, we were like brothers and, and <laughs> siblings. Actually, we had very similar costumes, very similar food. Uh, the attitude of the people is very similar, uh, but Venezuela people are more like uh, people from the coast, from the Caribbean coast, because Venezuela is also a Caribbean country. So even sometimes you confuse the accent from, from Barranquilla with Venezuelans. Uh, oh, so God. we are really similar to them, not that much with Bogota, with people from Bogota, but for example, um, from San Cristobal in Venezuela, that's a city in the mountains, in the Andes, Venezuelan Andes, so we are more like Bogota people. And so it's like a, a, a mix of it. But I think that overall, we are really similar countries. We said Colombia and Venezuela, and we are siblings. And we are re really similar. Wow. Um, I know a number of uh, Venezuelans, and it seems like uh, a lot of Venezuelans are living kind of like all over yeah. now uh where have you found like a lot of your friends or people that you know where, where do they live mainly now if they have left the country well there are six millions of venezuelans out of venezuela uh, we were a country of 30 million people now there are like 25 24 million people in, in venezuela so yeah there's a lot of people in all the world really um, I have friends, I mean, in Canada, United States, Mexico, um, Panama, Chile, Peru, Spain, uh, France, England, so a, a lot of places, Argentina. Yeah. 
Yeah. All I'll over. see you there. I'm a lot of places. All right. So you're in Colombia. What do you, what do you think people value the most there? Yeah. Family here. Mm. I think it's something in all the Latin culture that we, we value family a lot. Uh, for example, now in December, they have a, a costume to do. I don't know what will be the name in English. It's like a, some praise that you do to baby Jesus. Uh, yeah. It's called Novena, Novenas de Aguinaldo. So okay. it's something that you do in December. And it, it starts on December 16th until December 24th. That is the day that uh, baby Jesus was born in the midnight. Uh, so people gather together and they pray and sing and they share food. So it's a, it's a really good costume that, that we have, but it's part of what, what people values. I mean, being with the family, being with the people you love. Um, I think people here also are very identified with being Colombian. And I think it's a, a country that has struggled a lot with a lot, a lot of things that happened. I mean, the, the guerrilla and all that stuff, and they're like getting out of that a little bit. And, and I think that they, they have really strong identity uh, with, with them. And I will say music and sports. I mean, football here is, is crazy. <laughs> You ever gone to like a match, a match there, a game? A matcher? Yeah. Have you ever gone to a football game there? Not here. Not actually okay. not. I, I'm, I'm not a fan of football. Okay. Um, but I, the first time I came here in Colombia was actually on the World Cup. Uh, well, oh. You call it soccer, I believe. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So I was here in the World Cup in the first uh, stage. So I could see three matches in <laughs> And it was crazy because all of them, uh, Colombia won. So the, the streets were crazy. All this, the, I don't know, public places, the parks, people were there gathered together in watching big screens and they, they were celebrating. And so that, one, that was one of the things that made me come, like the joy of the people. Uh, it was really, really nice. It, you, you feel like good energy for, for that. Nice. What, so what like sights and sounds and smells does Bogota, Bogota have or remind you? Well, uh, unfortunately, we have a lot of smoke here, so okay. <laughs> uh, you can see that. Um, but I think right now it, it occurs to me to bread. <laughs> I'm living over a bakery, so <laughs> every nice. every afternoon they bake some some bread. Uh, but there's a lot of food variety here, and in, in like a lot of business are related with food like restaurants, uh, mini bars that sell food. I don't know, like, I mean, like food is really important here also. So I will say food, anywhere you can go, you can find a restaurant and you can find a good place to eat. So the, I mean, the best kind of food. It, it has like got smells and, and those types. Oh, I bet, I bet. Well, how do you get around the city? What do you use for transportation? Well, I have a car. Uh, yeah. because I love driving, but usually the traffic here is really, really heavy. Uh, so actually you, I can take my car out during weekdays. Uh, one day I can, one day no. So because there's a lot of traffic. So you are like only three or two days during weekdays, you can take out your car, depending on, on your uh, plate number. Really? You know, yeah so for example on even days if your car it's played and it's on even day you can on even number you cannot take out your car from one time to another time so it's like hard to take out your car so usually yeah. I, don't, I don't go out those days here there's a transport system called transmillennial that is just like a massive bus system and there is okay. like lanes only for for it but uh, they are starting to build the first line of the subway. It's not going to be a subway because it's going to be on the air, so it's going to be like a, a metro. I don't know how you I can okay. that. So is there is there a train system now or they're building that? In Bogota, there is no train system. There is okay. a train, but it's like a an old train that goes out of the city and takes like a central station, but few people use it. I mean, it's like a, you it's said a you said subway, so they're building a subway or I said subway, but it's not it's not on the ground, it's going to be on oh, the okay. earth. Okay. We have something like that in Chicago. 
where it's not underground it's like elevated yeah and you call it subway also we call it the l because it's an elevated track yeah ah okay cool the l (laughs) so everybody calls it the l on that yeah so if someone were to have a few days to spend in bogota and the area what would you recommend them doing well um I, I, I made like a little tour to this friend I, I told you in the beginning. So it was on Sunday and there's a market, like a flea market in Usaquén. Um, it's like a little old town inside the city. Uh, and near to that is like a financial area of the city. So it's like a contrast, con- contrast there. Uh, but there's a flea market that you can go there. There's also a lot of restaurants and a lot of little bars that you can go there. Uh, it's really nice. It's a square in a, in a church. Uh, you can take nice photos there. Uh, then you can go to La Candelaria. Uh, it's a place in downtown. It's at also Bolivar Square there. It's like the government palace in the ca- Bogota's Cathedral. Uh, it's also a nice place, a touristic place. So you can see a lot of people because like a street is only for people working. And there's a lot of like um, informal com- uh, commerce, like people selling things in, in, oh, in yeah. art and selling like traditional food on the street. Um, so that's interesting to go. And you can go also there's in La Candelaria, there's a place called Chorro de Quevedo. So it's like a little square, I think it was I don't know if it was the first square or one of the first squares in, in, Bogota, in Bogota. So it's also a good place to, to go. And you can go to Monserrate, that is a mountain. It's like a 3,100 meters over sea level. And you can go there by, I don't know what is the name. Um, I have, let me check on my translator. Uh, on cable way or on funicular is it uh it's like this that goes up in the mountains the, that's the funicular yeah actually that's the view from for for the funicular going up or going down i don't know <laughs> that and is it beautiful happened. it's yeah it's amazing you can see most of the city from there because the city is really big. So you can you cannot see all the city, but you can see most of the city, like half of it, a little bit more than, than half. Yeah. And it's a great view. So in the mountain, there's like a church and it's called Church of Monserrate. And you can go to, to yeah, to, to the church there. And you can have a beautiful uh, view of the city. I will recommend to go around 4.30, 5 p.m. Because usually here at 6 p.m., 6.10, it uh, is the sunset. So you can see the city during the day. You can see the sunset and then the city in the night. And both views, all the views are are going to be beautiful. Do you ever go hiking? Do people go hiking in the mountain? Yeah, there is is a a road or or a way that you can go and uh, stairs that you, you can go up. Once I did it, almost because of the hike. You, you, I mean, you take your breath out and you're without breath. There's no much oxygen here. And it took me like a one hour and seven minutes to go from the top to the, from the bottom to the top of the mountain. It's like two kilometers away. Wow. What did you say the elevation's like? Uh, 2,000? 3,100 3, wow. meters. I don't know how that's in feet that's a lot something i gotta get used to is like translating uh celsius to fahrenheit yeah. and uh <laughs> meters meters to feet and yards uh interesting so so okay so you're a software engineer what sparked your interest in software engineering originally i don't know probably a, a, a course that i did when i was like seven years old and i started to love computers then as I, ha- I, I went well in that course, my, my father bought me a computer. It was like 
six. I mean, he wasn't a Pentium even. I was like eight years old when I got that. And I started for play, using for playing and also like doing, I don't know, using DOS uh, operating system. And I was like really into it. And that, that was one option. When I was in high school, there was like a high school specialization in software and I did it. Then I joined college in that. So I don't know. I think uh, I'm very structured and person and I always love maths and physics and all that stuff. So I think it was like a, a good match for me. Yeah, software engineering. Yeah. So and after like, I, I, I mean, after I finished my uh, college and I started working on, I mean, web pages, I was a PHP developer and to see what it was able to build and something that people use, I think that was really good for me. I mean, like, really more motivating. You felt that what you were working on has like some meaning, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, you are not saving the world, <laughs> but it's something that people use, something that people can see and, and it was was really cool. Do you find, so, so it's, uh, you're engineering, you're using math, you're using, um, computer you're using computers do you find that a lot of the stuff that you do is transferable to like the united states or asia or is like software engineering global this the same globally or exactly yeah i mean it's the same code it's the same language i mean you when you do uh, uh, an application or software you're doing it with a language called Java, PHP, uh, .NET, whatever. So it's a, it's a language that you build. I mean, you build something with that language. And whether you are from Singapore, from Argentina, from Venezuela, for Europe, you are using the same language to build something. So it's not going to change. It's the same language. Uh, and everyone who, who wants to build something on that has to use that language. So yeah, I mean, it, it's the same all over the world all it's over the world so what do, what do you like building in particular is there any like uh particular stuff you like to build well currently i'm working as a project manager i stopped being a developer years ago but i love you know develop developing web pages and websites websites in general web applications and like for Years ago, I started using some uh, uh, framework called Ionic that you could build mobile application. That was really, really nice for me. It was like a, a, a cool thing to learn because I, I don't know, you learn a lot about how the cell phone works and receiving notifications and working with the GPS and the maps and I don't know, uh, like code bars and all that stuff. So it was, it was nice to, to do that. So in the information age that we uh, we live in, what would you say the role of software engineers are and how do you see it evolving over the next like 20 years? I mean, it changes the world. Uh, if you think 25 years ago when the web started, uh, things were really different. Now you use web for everything. You use internet for everything. Uh, you have now mobile applications and, and you can order food just with some tabs in, on, on your cell phone. So I think it, it's really important for, for, for the world. It's part of the evolution and uh, as a human uh, race, you know, uh, uh, as a species. <laughs> um, now with the blockchain and, and all that stuff, I mean, things are changing really, really fast. And I don't know, I think believe then or... 11 years ago, there was like the first iPhone that was like really basic. And now you have something that is almost better than your computer. Yeah. And yeah, so <laughs> I think that that this is uh, something that can help improve the quality of life uh, of people's uh, lives, not only on, on entertaining or I don't know, but actually in in health, in medicine, there's a lot of, of, of devices that use software, uh, I mean, air control and traveling and everything. You use software, software for everything. So it's going to help make things easier 
every time no you mentioned blockchain can you can you describe blockchain to me a little more wow that's really complex <laughs> Uh, I don't even if it's complex for you, it's even more complex for me. Complex, yeah. Uh, it's blockchain is like a decentralized network um, that is built to many things. I mean, the idea of the internet is probably in the beginning that it was something decentralized, but governments had started to centralize it and regulate it. Blockchain, you cannot regulate it because it's not on one server, it's on everyone's uh, machine. I mean, the people who are uh, lending their machines to, to do blockchain operations. So it's like, I don't know how, 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 to, how to say what I understand that is blockchain because I, 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 can, I can really say it, but is like a tool that helps um, people to do operations in a way that it's open and everyone can see what is going on in there, you know? Uh, because it builds like blocks that several machines validate. So several machines has those information. So it's not in a server, like currently, for example, Facebook, it, it's on different servers and you connect to those servers. No, now it's, in, each people computer and everyone who's on the blockchain has information that you everybody can see. So is it like, is it like, like say, it's like having your own personal like identity or data on a blockchain and you can take it as like a package everywhere you go so like you don't have to input your say personal information every single place on every single like website you just like take your identity or your information and data and interact with the not, internet not necessarily personal information okay. but i'm going to explain it this way i don't know for example if you connect to gmail to uh -huh. check your, your, your email. So you go to gmail.com and what you are doing is connecting to a server that's mm. located in a specific part. And that server is just a computer that gives you the information that it has stored. So, I mean, you log in with your login, your account, whatever, and they give you the information. That's like a, usually what web works. So blockchain is uh, more related to transactions. So for example, uh, I'm going to sell you something. I'm going to yeah. send you, I don't know, that mug that you have there. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to sell this mug to Rich. And I'm going to sell it at that price. And he's going to pay me in that way. And I don't know, other several uh, info. So to do that transaction, uh, several computers, has to validate that transaction and saying, okay, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, okay, 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 okay. So 10 computers say, okay. So all of them have information that I am going to sell or I sold you that mock. Mm -hmm. That it's written on the blockchain and everyone who is in that blockchain have access to that information. See, for example, it's not, for example, uh, um, if I sell my house right now, uh, I can go, I have to go to a government establishment so I can sign a paper and only they know. And only they validate that the transaction was done. No, here there are several computers that validate that the transaction was done. So it's decentralized because there, there is no uh, entity that says if it happened, if it's cool or not. There are okay. several entities that it's on the blockchain and it's open. So they are the ones who validate it. Something so, like that. So it's okay. almost like, uh, okay, so you use the word decentralized. So yeah. it's like what happens between us, we can just have it and then have it validated by the blockchain, this open source thing, rather than having to like 
hey, I want to do this transaction with you. We have to go over here for approval, get paperwork over here. It's just like mo more instant and more. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. What, what is the, the, the advantage of it? For example, I don't know, one thing that it occurs to me. Uh, in some places there are issues because people are faking their titles of the college and they say that they are engineers and they actually didn't study, whatever. So as a, it's a centralized establishment that say that these people are really engineers or not, it's really difficult for, I don't know, 10,000 people validate that, that title is from that entity. So if we have, for example, a titles on blockchain, and we say that Rich, I don't know, is engineer, because he graduated, you just can go to the blockchain and validate it. And it's true because it's there in several um, machines validated that that was, that was true. So is this um, incorporating like machine learning and like AI and data algorithms to like validate it or? Uh... No, that's different. That's okay. other kind uh, of stuff. But it's like several computers that validate information, validate transactions, and that store those transactions and they keep store in the blockchain. You cannot delete it. It's going, it's going to be there always. So do you feel like blockchain is going to be, a, uh, if it's not already like a really big thing? Is a big thing. I mean, it's like a, for me, it's like as important as web when web started. I mean, really? it, it, it's, yeah. And right now, I don't know if you have heard about NFTs. Yeah. I mean, that's the boom right now. And people are making millions and millions of dollars with that. And also with currencies and mining currencies, uh, cryptocurrencies and yielding also currencies. I mean, yielding blockchains. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that people are doing now in blockchain that we don't even know. And it's like moving so fast, so fast that when you try to do something, it's like, ah, it's already late. We, we are over that. We are now doing this. So yeah, I think it, it, it's going to be massive for me. The thing is that as it's really complex to understand. Yeah, yeah, I can tell. <laughs> yeah. So people are not like uh, into it, but I think that people are, are going to learn and probably the next steps are making it easier so everybody understands and everybody can join. Um, I think that, that for me, that will be the, the next step. So do you feel like uh, new things that are happening on blockchain will make life easier and simpler and allow us to make quicker, better decisions overall? I believe so. Yeah, I believe so. I think that, that when something is so complicated but brings so many advantages, I think that the next step is try to make it uncomplicated and try yeah. to get people more into it. So there are a lot of applications now built on blockchain and probably they're building like protocols or uh, applications that will make your um, interaction with blockchain be easier for you, and easier for people to, to understand. Okay. What other what other technologies are you aware of that you think will be like bigger or like will help you build software better and easier? I don't know. Probably every every time there's going to be a new framework that's going to be easier. That's going to be um, like give more advantages. And for example, there's something called augmented augmented coding. That is going to be something that helps a lot to the developers to code easier and also to have like a natural language to code. I mean, because coding is like having instructions and say, for example, I don't know, a, a plus B equals this. And then the next line is, I mean, it's like a series of instructions. So, but it's like you have to know the language, as I was saying before, to make those instructions. So probably the next step is that everyone, everyone can code in natural language. And you know, when to code also is, is something that, that it, it, it's uh, 
like growing really fast. So do you uh, have to, do you have to like learn all these languages or do you know, like, so say the technology keeps getting better and better. Do you have to then like retrain yourself on a saw, so like a, a learn how to code or learn the language for like the new, or is everything starting to like build on top of each other where your the language you need to know, like it becomes simplified in a way? You have to learn. You have to learn okay. every new language that's coming, uh, yeah. that's coming up. Because, for example, right now, well, I believe that JavaScript is one of the most famous. So there has been like a different frameworks from JavaScript. A framework is like a, a set of uh, functions and libraries that help you build bigger and more robust software in in an easy easier way. So, for example, like. In 2007, I started, there was something called jQuery. In 2012 was Angular, now it's React. Now Vue is coming out. So you have to learn, you have to learn all that. Okay. What's, the, what, what's the thing that when you learn coding, you learn the logic of it. I mean, the first thing that you've been taught in university is learn algorithms, how to make algorithms. So you have the logic and when you have the logic and when you have geos working on a language, it's going to be easier to learn a new language. For example, the last time I, I, I called, I told you that I was going, I was working with Ionic. And I mean, I had like three years without coding and it was easier for me to learn because I had that experience before, that, that previous experience, okay. it was something new. So, I mean, it's an ability that you're gaining with the years. And even if, if you have to learn a new language, but the logic that you have to apply to build something is probably going to be the same, so. Mm, interesting. Yeah. And also Google helps a lot with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you had mentioned like web applications and uh, you know, writing or creating software for all these different, um, like everything we use. There's so many things I use software what do you see how do you see it advancing even more beyond just like an iphone application like software to make stuff doing an iphone like what what is beyond like the iphone or like software in some of these things you today? saw the movie wally -E? i have not what you have to see it it's i know i need to watch more movies <laughs> yeah <laughs> well for me something like that something like i mean you don't even have to do anything because software is going to do everything for you for example um in cars you know that no uh, cars have a ship that they use and they have software that helps and they have a lot of sensors that measure things and they give you the information for example now mercedes has something that's called mbux and you can talk to the, to the car and, hey, Mercedes, uh, please close the, I don't know, the windows. Uh, or, hey, Mercedes, I'm cold. So it hits uh, the, the temperature, it, it's up. So uh, you can use it and anywhere, anything that you, you, that you imagine. And I think that that's the future. I mean, I think that, for example, now the Morix, I, I don't know if that's the, call, the right word. It's called domotica in, in Spanish, but it's like, uh, making your home like a smart home uh, so you can close the windows with a with, with a i don't know with a call yeah, please google hey google close the window and there's a like a um, smart bulbs for uh -huh. for light and you connect it to the wi-fi and if you are i don't know in europe in your topic okay i'm going to turn this on so people think that i'm at, at house and all that kind of stuff i mean it looks like like minimal things but it's going to make our life easier in some way. And if there's not a need that we have, they're going to find it and make it a need. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what are your favorite devices? Like, what do you, around your apartment, like what, what, what like uh, technology devices or digital devices do you use and love? My cell phone. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, because I mean, I control everything from there. Uh, I can have meetings in there. I can write in there. I can use it as a computer. I can. I mean, I. I think that I'm nothing without my without my cell phone. I'm I'm really attached to it. What kind of phone do you have? I have Samsung S21 Ultra. Okay. Why do you choose Android over iOS? Here in like, I mean, here in Latin America, Android is more is like a, more famous than than iOS. People, I mean, people use iOS, but it usually it's cheaper. So there's a lot of devices here that at Android, um, and iOS is more like having a status. Um, what I don't like of iOS is that it's like a really closed system. So it's going to be hard to use it with different brands and different other stuff. So it's only iOS on Apple. So, so you, for me, you're an engineer. You like to customize everything to make it optimal to your yeah, liking, right? Exactly. I like, uh, yeah. And if it's something new. So for example, I, I have like a Huawei uh, smart, uh, smartwatch and my cell phone was Samsung and my Airbus watch Xiaomi. So, I mean, it was like different stuff. Right now, yeah. I have everything from Samsung because I love Samsung. Uh, but it gives you the opportunity to, yeah, to connect with other technologies, to pair your devices with other brands, not only yeah. with the same brand. I mean, I, I'm not saying that iOS is worse or bad because it's a good system. I mean, it's a really strong and, and, and reliable uh, uh, iOS and, and system. But I prefer Android. I believe that they are innovating. Usually, they are the ones that innovate. And the last couple of years, iOS is like just catching up. Okay, I feel that. Is my belief. So what? Besides your phone, what? What like piece of uh, electronics? What electronics do you like? Like a uh, like a speaker or TV or a. Uh, Smart my smartwatch something <laughs> smartwatch, yeah. Because when I'm far from my from my phone, I can manage everything from here. Also, well, I'm in this uh, fitness wave that after the pandemics, I have to walk some many steps and burn that many calories. So I have here in my phone how many calories I have in my smartwatch, how many calories I have burned, how many steps I have done, and how many. It means I have been active, so I have this information here, and I, okay, I have to exercise more, or I can rest. So yeah, I'm also attached to my smartwatch and my earbuds. That's what I hear most about uh, smartwatches: is people people like them either because they're away from their phone and they can do stuff still, but also like fitness. Like fitness yeah. seems to be a huge driver of smartwatches. Yeah. How do you see like smartwatches? expanding their uses like what do you imagine potential uses becoming probably probably in the future they can substitute cell phones and i don't know you have a hologram and you can text here i don't know probably because i mean it's smaller it's practical and it's easier for example one day i was washing the dishes and i received a phone call so i was here and i was like okay let's test it and then I received a call from the watch and I was like speaking like, I don't know, Super Agent 86. And yeah, I I don't know. And I was doing everything. So yeah, and I didn't have to stop washing the dishes, drying my hands and grab the phone. So I did it all from, from, from the watch. So probably depending on if they find the technology to do it and make it easier and, to, and user friendly, probably it can substitute the phone, maybe. Yeah, user friendliness. Interesting. Yeah. Um, in your line, in like your discipline, are there any trends that you've noticed within business or society? Well, as I said, right now I'm working as a project manager. So it's like working methodologies and all the stuff like agile, et cetera. But in software in general, I think that data science is something that's becoming really, really, really big. Uh, AI, Internet of Things, and blockchain are the main things that are the main topics that are, are, are coming right now. I mean, also test automation is something that's 
becoming really big. And yeah, each time there's a bigger need of uh, software engineers, of developers. Uh, I mean, I think it's something that it's never going to be fill up the 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 amount of engineers that there there are are need for for software industry. Yeah, it seems like it's a it's a field that is just only going to grow and grow and way grow. more expansive. Yeah. Exactly. And and probably teaching uh, young individuals earlier and earlier how to code and how to do things like that, right? Yeah, exactly. I think that that will be a, a good opportunity. And overall here in Latin America that we are uh, countries in, in development, I think that that could be a good way to, to I don't know, to activate the economy. Yeah. Uh, because, for example, look at what's going on in California. California is a really big state with big uh, economics in it. Some part of that is because of software. So that's something that, that we call implement here, but unfortunately politicians don't see that. Mm. Really? What, how do you think they see it? They don't, they don't look at software the same, well, obviously the same way as you, because you're in it, but. Yeah. I think that they don't see it because they don't know how to get money from that. I'm sorry to say that, but here, usually in Latin America, if politicians don't get money from something, it's not worth it. So, um, well, this is a, that is going to through another topic that is politics. Uh, but unfortunately, here politics are not for the people and for the country. They are for their own interest and for having mm. power or having money and you know, yeah. those kind of things. So it, it, it's a shame because we have here a lot of potential. We have here a, a lot of smart people. A lot of people that want to create startups, to grow, to, to make enterprises, but it's really difficult uh, to create a company uh, with the taxes and all the stuff. So mm, it, it, it's hard to, to do that. And I think, for example, something that has benefit from the pandemic is actually that in the United States, they are hiding people from Latin America and as they don't find it, I mean, they don't find people in the United States because there are a lot of need of software engineers. So they come here to Latin America to find people and they are hiring engineers here in Latin America. So the, the salaries are increasing here in, in the software environment. Uh, but you, you pay the health here that what they pay in, in, in America. So it's a win-win uh, relationship. Um, and I think that we can export more people or make more people start coding and start learning about that because I know a lot of people that didn't went to college or study a different subject and they are right now yeah. coding. Yeah, I think that's that's going to be a more um, more of a priority. Is uh, I think starting with the pandemic is like prioritizing skills over like anything else it's like we need people to do this where can we find people it doesn't matter if the united states we can find the people anywhere in the world that have these particular skills and like hire them and work with them remotely because we do have the technology that we have now i mean we're even talking to each other, you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're on other sides of the equator and we're like talking to each other and not having any technical problems. It's like, it's pretty, pretty interesting the world right now, I think. Yeah, exactly. And they realize that and they, they, they say that what's going to be affected is the travel industry because now you, they realize that they don't need to travel that much to have meetings and all the stuff. So probably uh, airplane tickets are going to, <laughs> to rise a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many interesting. Yeah. The life, life is pretty interesting right now. The world. Um, yeah. Do you have, really interesting. <laughs> yeah. Do you have uh, any influences or like, like three 
people or things that have influenced your outlook on life, whether they're people, books, art, film, any other pieces of art mediums? I I do the movies regularly. Actually, that's one was one of the things that, that I missed the most during the pandemics. Um, so I get influenced a lot by that and by some shows that I see and all the stuff. Uh, for example, one of the movies that influenced me the most, even though I have seen it like only two or two times, uh, I don't know the exact name is like uh, Incredible Adventures of Walter Meaty. I don't know if you have heard of it. If we, what is it? The uh, Adventures of Walter Meaty. So it's about a guy who was like self-involved in his work and he's like all his routine and all the stuff. So he was working in, in Time magazine, I believe. So it was going to be the last edition of Time because the company was going to close, something like that. And he had to find the perfect picture for the cover. And he had like the best photographer, photographer in the world. He has to find him. So in order to do that, he has to go out of his, of his comfort zone and travel and do things that he'd never imagined he will do. So it's like really inspiring. And um, it makes you think that sometimes you are like really into your comfort zone that you are like doing the same stuff, like, and sometimes you get bored, but you don't know what's going on in your life. And sometimes you just need to leave to go out, to learn, to meet people, to meet new places. So I think, I don't know if because of the movie, but I love to have new experiences. Even if it's meeting a new restaurant, a new bar, a new park, a new town close to the city. So I think that that kind of things make you live. I mean, you live, I mean, you, you can measure your life with the kind of the amount of experiences you have had. If you live in the same place all the time, what is your experience? Yeah. You know? You're more likely to have an experience stepping outside of your apartment than you are just like grinding away in exactly. your own apartment. I'm saying yeah. that to myself because that's what I've been doing lately and I need to get out of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's a good one. So the life adventures of yeah. Walter Minchi. Mitty, I think he's, am I, let, let me check uh, here. What is the exact name of the movie? Walter, I think it's M-I-T-T-Y. The Incredible Life of Walter Mitty. It's M-I-T-T-Y. Is it a um, Colombian film or? No, it's Spanish with Ben movie? Stiller. It's oh, American. really? Interesting. Yeah, uh, Ben Stiller, Kristen Wiig, and Sean Penn. Cool. Um, okay, who are three musical artists that are in your heavy rotation recently? Well, this, I, 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 with this Spotify a summary that he does at the, at the end of the year. Yeah, the raps. Realize that, yeah, it makes me realize that my taste in music has changed a lot since I came to into Colombia. <laughs> yeah. Because usually I was used to listen to pop music in English in rock in pop music in English. Now it's like only reggaeton. Oh, dude, I love reggaeton. <laughs> So I think the first one was J Balvin. Yeah, I love J Balvin. Carol D and Maluma. <laughs> These are three Colombian artists. They are, they are from Medellin. And I don't know, I, I can't help uh, stop listening to them. I, I like the beat and it's like, a, yeah. I mean, you're happy, uh, you're not melancholic, you're not sad. It's like, oh, you're cool. So J, you said J Balvin, uh, Maluma, what was the second one? Carol G. Oh, Carol G? Carol yeah. G, yeah. yeah. Have you heard of her? Yeah, I have. Okay. I uh, yeah, I I listen to some reggaeton for sure. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. It's nice. cool now. I'm I'm seeing that this is like a like breaking boundaries. I have seen a lot of, of American singers singing with people yeah. who sings reggaeton. 
for example, J Lo with Maluma and Madonna with Maluma and uh, Nicki Minaj with Carl G, Beyonce with J Balvin, and I don't know, probably it's like you know, like making more integration with both cultures, Latin Latin yeah. culture and American culture. I mean, we, we are yeah. in the same continent. Well, for us, it's the same continent, and, yeah. and we should be more integrated. So, I think that that's a good thing that's coming up from that. Yeah, I see that too. I see like uh, it's like sounds in the world starting to blend and collaborate together in a way. Like I definitely see that with because in the United States too, there's a very large Latin population, so it makes sense that like a lot of um, like Spanish Spanish songs or like Spanish speaking songs, Spanish language songs would come here to the United States and they would collaborate uh, commercially. I also see it with Korea, like Korea, like K-pop is more popular mm. in the United States. So like United States pop now is becoming more like expansive and uh, worldly. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And that's cool. I mean, I think that the United States is like a, like a center of all culture. I mean, there are a lot of yeah. people from a lot of places in the world. So you have like a big mix of everything. So it, I think it's normal. And also you are like a big influence to other countries. So that I think that that's something good. Yeah. Uh, I like asking this question the most of like any questions I ask us. What are you curious about recently? Curious? NFTs? <laughs> NFTs. Yeah, I think that a lot of people are making a lot of money with that. So I th I see something complex, but not as complex as, I don't know, crypt cryptocurrencies. Okay. So I'm learning more a little bit about that. And, and I think that um, something good can, can, can come from, from that. I don't, know, and I don't know if probably it's a boom. It's, I don't know if it's something that's going to take to stay for a while. But I think it's something that you have to look up to to, to see what, what can happen with that. Yeah. Uh, what's the best airport you've experienced? Oh, I think probably Madrid airport. Madrid? It's really, really, yeah, it's really, really big. And it was like the first big airport I, I met while traveling. I mean, after Colombia and Dominican Republic, I went to Madrid. So it was like really, really, really big. And it has like this train. I mean, in the United States, there's a lot of airports with trains, but for me, it was like a new experience, like in the same airport, having a little train to go to another station or terminal. Yeah. Uh, but I think it, it, it's, I don't know how to say it, but it's, it's like cool, it's beautiful. I mean, like it's built in a way that you can, you see, oh my God, this, uh, this is a nice, nice place. It's not like just an airport to be an airport, you know? Yeah. And I also think that Bogota's airport is really nice. I think it's really modern. It's big. It's a big airport. And you can be surprised. And it's, it's like a good entry to the city because, I'm, I don't know, probably many people may think that Colombia is like a, I don't know, jungle or something like that. But it's like a, you go to the airport and you can be almost like, wow, this is really big and, and it's nicely done. And it's like a, looks like a luxury airport. So for me, it's a, it's a nice one. And the VIP salon from Bogota Airport is another experience. Wow. I got to check out Bogota. I've, I've done the Madrid. The first time I left the country or uh, traveled okay. outside the United States, it was Spain. And I flew into Madrid. And okay. I remember, I don't remember too much about it was like four years ago and um i remember these like like colorful it was like yeah yeah it was, it was like colorful in this walkway but i remember it was like my first time out of the country and it was by myself and i don't know spanish so <laughs> like the woman sitting next to me on the plane she like basically just i followed her and i was just, so i was very unaware of like everything else i was okay. just trying to make make sure she wasn't out of my sight so she could show me where to go and how to get out. <laughs> so I need yeah. to go back to Madrid and check out the airport. 
Yeah, actually, it has like a place that, like a roof with a lot of uh, lamps, and it's like really nice. I actually has have a photo of that in my Instagram, but it's yeah. it was in 2012, something like that. I mean, a long time ago, nine years ago. Yeah. So yeah, it has like it, its places, and it's like I don't know, it's different. The roof also has like a I don't know, a weird wave. I don't know, it, it, it's kind of different. Cool. Uh, well, my last question for you before we head out here is what's something you're excited about for the next two years? The end of the pandemics. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, here there's uh, some restrictions yet. You have to go with the, with the mask, mask on and all the stuff. Um, but I would like to see like the, the final changes of how it affects people you know we as a society mm -hmm. uh, i would like to see that i would like to to see what what came from that now you can see some stuff for example that we were talking about that you don't need to travel to have these meetings and people yeah. realize that technology can be a, a good bridge for communication um but i don't know i i, I mean in the in the social way how can we help each other how can we manage the situation? Yeah. Uh, allegedly, there are people saying that another pandemics are going to come. So if we are going to be more prepared for that, I hope not. But <laughs> I mean, I don't. Ho I hope not. Yeah. Uh, not any pandemics in the future. So, so yeah, certainly I, I like, like a social change from 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 the pandemics. Yeah, that'll be really interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on. This has been been great talking with you and learning more about Colombia and. Uh, talking about the future of like with software engineering and software. It's exciting. Thank yeah, you. Thank you for inviting me in anytime. <laughs>